the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and on behalf of his council, I welcome all of you, members and guests alike, to this service of worship as we gather to celebrate God's grace and goodness. Shall we stand to hear his call to worship? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let's take a moment of final preparation and silent prayer. Shall we pray? Congregation left by our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Our opening song of praise is number 119A. We're going to sing all three stanzas, 119A, and we'll remain standing after the singing of this song to confess our undoubted Christian ap- apostolic faith. So 119a, and then immediately thereafter, we will confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed.
Then before our watching world, let us acknowledge our faith in the triune God with one heart and with one voice, together saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In praise to this triune God, let's sing the fourth stanza of number 230. You'll find in your forms and prayers books at page 9, the form for the baptism of infants. I invite you to turn there now, page 9 in your forms and prayers books. As we prepare to witness the baptism of Samuel Albert Fladeris, we do so in light of what the Word of God teaches concerning baptism. And that teaching is laid forth for us in this form in the following way. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, what the Lord has revealed to us in His Word about holy baptism can be summarized in this way. First, baptism teaches that we and our children are conceived and born in sin. This means that we are by nature children of wrath and for that reason cannot be members of Christ's kingdom unless we are born again. Baptism, whether by immersion or sprinkling, teaches that sin has made us so impure that we must undergo a cleansing which only God can accomplish. By this we are admonished to detest ourselves, humble ourselves before God, and turn to Him for our cleansing and salvation. Second, baptism signifies and seals to us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. For this reason, we are baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized into the name of the Father, God the Father testifies and seals to us that He makes an eternal covenant of grace with us and adopts us as his children and heirs. Therefore, he promises to provide us with everything good and protect us from all evil or turn turn it to our profit. When we are baptized into the name of the Son, God the Son seals to us that he washes us in his blood from all our sins. Christ unites us to himself so that we share in his death and resurrection. Through this union with Christ, we are freed from our sins and accounted righteous before God. When we are baptized into the name of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit assures us by this holy sacrament that He will make His home within us and will sanctify us as members of Christ. He will impart to us what we have in Christ, namely the washing away of our sins and the daily renewing of our lives. As a result of His work within us, we shall finally be presented without the stain of sin among the assembly of the elect in life eternal. Third, the covenant of grace contains both promises and obligations. Having considered the promises, we now consider the obligations. 
Through baptism, God calls us and places us under obligation to live in new obedience to Him. This means that we must cling to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We must trust in Him and love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We must renounce the sinful way of life. We must put to death the old nature and show by our lives that we belong to God. If we through weakness should fall into sin, we must not despair of God's mercy nor use our weakness as an excuse to keep sinning. Baptism is a seal and totally reliable witness that we have an eternal covenant with God. Our children should not be excluded from baptism because of their inability to understand its meaning. Just as without their knowledge they share in Adam's condemnation, so are they, without their knowledge, received to grace in Christ. God's gracious attitude toward us and our children is revealed in what he said to Abraham, the father of all believers. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. The Apostle Peter also testifies to this with these words. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Therefore God formally commanded that children be circumcised as a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness that comes by faith. Christ also recognized that children are members of the covenant people when he embraced them, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Since baptism has replaced circumcision as the sign and seal of the covenant, our children should be baptized as heirs of God's kingdom and of his covenant. As children grow up, their parents are responsible for teaching them the meaning of baptism. In order that we may now administer this holy sacrament of God to his glory for our comfort and to the edification of the church, let's call upon his holy name. Shall we pray? Almighty eternal God, long ago you severely punished an unbelieving and unrepentant world in holy judgment by sending a flood. But in your great mercy, you saved and protected believing Noah and his family. You also drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and his whole army in the Red Sea, and you brought your people Israel through the sea on dry ground. In these acts, you revealed the meaning of baptism and the mercies of your covenant in saving your people, who of themselves deserve your, whole, your condemnation. We therefore pray that in your infinite mercy you will graciously look upon this your child and bring him into union with your Son, Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit. May Samuel be buried with Christ into death and be raised with him to walk in newness of life. We pray that he may follow Christ day by day, may joyfully bear his cross, and may cling to him in true faith, firm hope, and ardent love. Comfort him in your grace, so that when he leaves this life and its constant struggle against the power of sin, he may appear before the judgment seat of Christ, your Son, without fear. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the one and only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. And I'd invite Brad and Yolanda to join me at the baptismal font. Beloved in Christ the Lord, as you've now heard, baptism is given to us by God to seal his covenant to us and our children. We must therefore use the sacrament for the purpose that God intended and not out of superstition or mere custom, that it may be clear that you're doing what God commands you to answer sincerely the following questions. First, do you acknowledge that our children who are conceived and born in sin and thus subject to the misery that sin brings, even the condemnation of God, are sanctified in Christ, and so as members of his church ought to be baptized. Second, do you acknowledge that the teaching of the Old and the New Testament, summarized in the Articles of the Christian Faith and taught in this Christian church, is the true and complete doctrine of salvation? And then third, do you sincerely promise to do all you can to teach this child and to have him taught this doctrine of salvation? Brad and Yolanda, what is your answer? We do. I'm going to invite you to present your son for baptism. Samuel Albert Fladeris, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And to you, the congregation, to you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive this child in love. Pray for him. Help care for his instruction in the faith and encourage and sustain him in the fellowship of believers. Congregation, what is your answer? Then let's pray. 
Almighty God and merciful Father, we thank and praise you that you have forgiven us and our children all our sins through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. You receive us through your Holy Spirit as members of your only begotten Son and adopt us as your children, sealing and confirming this to us by holy baptism. We earnestly pray now through your beloved Son that you will always govern Samuel by your Holy Spirit. May he be nurtured in the Christian faith and in godliness and grow and develop in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that he may see your fatherly goodness and mercy which you've shown to him and to us all. And may he live in all righteousness under our only teacher, King and High Priest, Jesus Christ. Give him the courage to fight against and overcome sin, the devil, and his whole dominion. And may he forever praise and magnify you and your Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one and only true God. Amen. And we're going to sing in response and in praise to the God who covenants with his people from number 193. We're going to sing the stanzas one and four. Number 193 in our Trinity Psalter hymnals will stand to sing the stanzas one and four. Then just a few notes before we go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Brad and Yolanda are inviting us all to socialize, to enjoy coffee after this service, so please take note of that as well. Again, for the members of this congregation, the prayer day Thursday at uh, 7.30. And as well, you will see in next week's bulletin a note concerning uh, Lydia Algersma and her upcoming wedding. I only mention that because today is the last day she'll be playing the organ for us. So if you've been blessed by her, encourage her and give her thanks. So we come to the Lord then in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you who are the great creator of life, who make and fashion us and are able, O Heavenly God and Father, to give us understanding, we pray, Lord, now look upon us in your favor that we may learn your word and may live by your will so that those who fear you will see us and rejoice, will be encouraged and will be challenged to put their trust and their hope in your word, even as we hope in your word. For we know, Lord, that your word, your will, your laws and commands, your teachings are right and true, 
And that in faithfulness, you guide and guard us even when we face the challenges of this life. Yes, Lord, we can acknowledge that in faithfulness, you are the one who disciples us, who disciplines us, who afflicts us, for you love us. Indeed, let your steadfast love comfort us according to your promise, and let your mercy come to us that we may live. For our, law, for our will, Lord, is to do your will. Your law is our delight. We pray that you would help us to live in that way. So that even those, Lord, who rebel against you, those who reject you, may be put to shame because they've wronged us with falsehood, besmirching and deriding the faith that we profess and the life that we live. But let those who fear you turn to us, Lord, that they may know your testimonies. And may our hearts be blameless in your statutes that we may not be put to shame. For, oh God, we long for your salvation. We rejoice in your faithfulness, even now as we have again heard your promises made to this precious life, we long for those promises to be fulfilled. We indeed ask, Lord, when will your comfort be ours? Especially in the times of trial and tribulation. Lord, we know life in this life is not easy. When we face challenges, trials, and sorrows, and griefs, we find ourselves so often, O oh, Heavenly God and for our Father, beset by physical challenges, emotional challenges, spiritual challenges. We can find ourselves so weak then, Lord, we can find ourselves so thin, so frail. And we pray, Heavenly God and Father, that you would help us to never forget your will and your word in those moments. Even as we acknowledge, O oh, Heavenly God and Father, You're the only one who can lift these burdens from us. And we do pray with those who are tired, Lord, those who are struggling, those who are sorrowful, how long must Your servant endure? We even ask, O oh, Heavenly God and Father, when will You come and judge those who oppose us, who oppose Your church, who oppose the Gospel? For there are so many in our world, so many, Lord, within the positions of power of our society and our culture, within the positions of government, who seek to dismiss Christians, who dig pitfalls for the church, who rejoice in their immorality and seek to do harm to your people. We are grateful, Lord, that we yet live in a place of peace and prosperity. Even as we are reminded, Lord, of our brothers and sisters in the faith and are under the cross and are worshiping, Lord, under oppression. We pray, Heavenly God and Father, that you would keep them faithful, even as we pray that you would keep us faithful, knowing that all your commandments are sure, and that as long as we trust in your will and word, Lord, you will bless. In your steadfast love, give us life that we may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Lord, we do thank you for the witness that you give to us of those who are devoted to the things of your word and will. We are encouraged again today, Lord, as we see our brothers and sisters from the anchor homes here with us to celebrate. We are grateful for each one of them, Lord, and we are grateful for their place among us. And we are especially, Lord, grateful for our brother John Van Weingarten, once a member of our congregation who yet returns and worships with us. We commend all of these, and especially our brother, to your care, and pray that you would continue to bless them, and that you would continue to use them as a light to the world. May others see in them your faithfulness and your grace. And may our commitment to their blessing, Lord, testify to the world that we are different than the cruel and heartless society in which we live that seeks to end life, to eliminate it. How often, Lord, don't we hear when there are any kind of signs of trouble in a pregnancy that the doctors and the nurses say, oh, just, just end the pregnancy and try again. We live in a world, Lord, where suffering is to be avoided not, not by surrendering all to Jesus Christ, but by escaping the pain. And it can be tempting for us, O oh, Heavenly God and Father, to join into that mentality and in that world. And to think that all suffering is bad because it causes us grief. Rather than seeing it as the purifying fire that removes the dross from our hearts. And that we wish, O oh, Heavenly God and Father, to 
more fully know and confess you, more fully rest in your sovereign grace, that our faith, more precious than silver, more costly than gold, might be purified by your hand. So help us, O heavenly God and Father, to rest only in your grace. You who have firmly fixed the heavens by your word, and you whose faithfulness and yours to all generations, having established the earth and making it stand fast. By your appointment they stand this day, for all things are your servants. And we look forward, Lord, in this coming week to gather with your people in celebration of your grace and to know that despite all of the cries and the clamoring of our world, you are the God who keeps covenant. And that the seasons roll one after another, that the sun and the rain, they come and bless the earth, not because we are deserving. Oh no, oh heavenly God and Father, were it not for your word, were it not for your grace in Jesus Christ in which we trust, we would have perished long ago. Indeed, O oh heavenly God and Father, we would then be like the world under its judgment. Lord, indeed, then this world would be utterly lost. But you have claimed us, and by your grace you have worked in us. You have given us a desire to live for you and to walk in the light of your word. Though the world around us may deny you, Lord, we, we see in your commands the breadth and the height and the depths and the wonder of your love in Jesus Christ. And so the know, O heavenly God and Father, that all things are as they are because you rule, that you reign through your Son upon this earth, and that our worship of you, Lord, is offered in praise of that grace. Indeed, we pray, heavenly God and Father, may our worship today Advance your cause and your kingdom on this earth. May it be an encouragement to all who are here. Believer, Lord, and if there be unbelievers among us alike, may they hear the good news of the gospel. May we all be encouraged by your faithfulness. We do thank you, Lord, for all of the work that goes into organizing and leading a worship service. We thank you for all of the work that's done to ensure that we can gather each week to celebrate your grace. We're thankful, Heavenly God and Father, for those that maintain the building and for those that keep things in order, even as we're grateful for those that accompany us in worship. We're grateful for each one and for their talent and their gifts that you give to us. And we thank you, Lord, especially today then for Lydia and for the way that she has also led us in worship over these past number of years. And we know and trust that she will be a blessing to others and Lord, we pray for that in her life and in all the lives of your people in this congregation. Wherever we go, Lord, may we be a light and a blessing to your church and to your people. We pray all of these things, O Heavenly God and Father, not because we deserve any of them, but because we know that you hear us and have made us bold in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Then we're going to stand to sing from number 529 as we prepare to hear God's Word. We're going to sing the two stanzas of 529 and we'll stand to sing.
And turn with me to 1 John chapter 3, page 1211, 1211 in your pew Bibles. We're going to read the first 10 verses as we consider what it is that the Lord teaches us through His Word, as it is summarized for us in the Heidelberg Catechism, or Lord's Day 32. We're going to see at least in part what it is that the Word of God teaches us on this matter in 1 John 3. But before we read that word, let us come before the Lord and ask for a blessing upon its reading. Shall we pray? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, before us now lies some of the most powerful words ever written, for they are the words of your Scriptures, the words that reveal your Son, Jesus Christ, the very power of life. Indeed, Lord, we acknowledge and confess that in this place we preach Christ and Him crucified, stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who believe the very power of God. Unleash that power now and open our eyes to see the glory of Your Son. Move our hearts to worship and lay hold of our lives that what we do and say in this coming week may be the praise of Your most holy name. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 John 3, beginning at verse 1, familiar words that begin this chapter. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. Because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Him or known Him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. That's for the reading of God's holy word. Then let's turn in our forms and prayers books or in our Trinity Psalter hymnals. If it's the forms and prayers books, it is page 237. And then if it's the Trinity Psalter hymnals, it's page 887. We're going to answer the questions of Lord's Day 32. Together we'll recite the answers to this first Lord's Day of the last section of the catechism. You know that the catechism is broken into sin, salvation, service, or guilt, grace, and gratitude. We are on the last section, gratitude. And here we find two question and answers. First, question and answer 86. Since we've been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ, without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? Because Christ, having redeemed us by His blood, is also renewing us by His Spirit into His image, so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for His benefits, and that He may be praised through us. And further, so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. And then question answer 87, can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful or unrepentant ways? By no means. Scripture tells us that no unchaste person, no idolater, adulterer, thief, no covetous person, No drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like will inherit the kingdom of God. This the church does believe. Mm 
Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, our Lord, one of the blessings of children, maybe not when they're first born, like Samuel, who's so little, but eventually, as Samuel grows and as he develops and he finds his voice and he begins to follow dad and mom around as they drive here and there in the car or as they're sitting at home, then eventually he'll begin to ask questions. That's what children do. They, they want to understand their world around them. They want to make sense of it, and so they start asking questions. Why is this the way it is? What does that mean? How does that work? The question why is maybe the one that they ask most often. After you give them an answer, then they say why. Why is that the answer? Why is that the way it is? Why? And the why can become incessant. It can become repetitive and endless to the point where mom and dad say that's enough. We're not answering any more questions. Now we're just going to sit quietly. But there's something lovely about asking why. There's something that is so very innocent and so very honest about the question why. I want to understand why. I don't just want to understand what I have to do. I don't want to understand how things are. I want to understand why they are the way they are. Why? Sometimes we don't ask that question sufficiently. Sometimes we don't ask that question honestly. As we get older, as we get more mature, and as we begin to live within the rhythm of life, as we begin to understand how life goes, what's right and what's wrong, especially in a culture such as ours, and I mean now our church culture, our community culture, we live in a very strong Christian culture where we move from home to school to church. Our friends are those that we live with from our earliest days and that we learn to walk with in the ways of life. They know the rhythm of life. They know the rules. We know the rules. We do what we're supposed to. We go to church when we're told to. We don't use language we're not supposed to. We respect those who are in authority over us. On and on it goes. And we don't tend to ask why. Everybody does it, so we don't need to ask why. Why? Because everyone else is doing. If you can imagine a flock of birds as they're flitting through the sky and suddenly that massive cloud of birds breaks left or veers right, if you could in that moment stop them and ask the one bird or all of the birds, why are you turning left? Why are you flying right? The answer would be because everyone else is, because that's what we're doing, because that's how it is. Too often when it comes to the Christian life, it's the same thing. Why are you doing what you're doing? Because that's what we do. We don't ask why. Why? There's not enough curiosity. There's not enough desire to understand the foundational issues or to dig deep under the ground of what it is that we do. In a short time, we're going to be studying the Ten Commandments. And then we're going to study the Lord's Prayer. We're going to be taught how to live the Christian life. How to order our thoughts, our affections, our actions, our words, so that they glorify God. But before we do any of that, the Catechism wants to answer one vital question for us, and it's the question, why? Why? Why do we live this way? Why do we act this way? Why do we do these things? Since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through, through Christ without any merit of our own, why do we do good works? You know, that's a really challenging question. Why do you do good works? Why do you live the Christian life the way that you do? Why is it that given all of this mercy, filled with all of this grace, provided all of this love so that you have to add nothing to the work of Jesus Christ. Remember, that's that's the context in which this question is asked. You might think of it this way. Think of those people who when they play the lottery and then suddenly win a, a massive amount of money. So much money that they don't ever need to work again. Probably not even their children or grandchildren. They could all live off of the interest of this great wealth. Imagine somebody meeting somebody like that and imagine that they show up the next day at work and and they show up at the next day at work with their old beater of a car and and they're still wearing their uh, uh, thread-worn clothing. You might say to them, 
Why in the world are you doing this? You could afford any car on the dealer's lot. You could pay cash and walk away with it that day. Why are you even coming to work at all? Why would you work when you don't have to? That's really what the catechism is asking, isn't it? Or at least that's the context in which we understand these things. Since salvation is all of grace, since Jesus' saving work is sufficient so that not a breath of yours, not a sigh is required in order to inherit eternal life so that there is nothing, no nothing you need to do in order to receive this grace. Oh, to be sure, you must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But even that trust is not a work. You must lay your hand out that the Lord might fill it with His mercy, but it is an empty hand. It is not a hand that earns or obtains anything of its own. Jesus has done everything to save you so that nothing you do can cause your eternal damnation. Nothing you do earns your salvation. Jesus has done it all. So then why, in the context of such a gospel, with such a good word proclaimed to us, why do you do any good? Why? Why do you serve? Why do you sacrifice? Why do you surrender? Why do you praise? We know what the world does. The world tells us that we have to be ourselves, that we ought to express ourselves, that being happy is truly being able to express our own identity so that when we do what we want, that's when we're happy. That's the theme of our culture. And the underlying principle behind this is that I'm a good person, inherently good, there's good in me, and I need to let that goodness out. I need to allow that that beauty that is who I am shine in this dark world, resisting the forces that are trying to oppress me. That's the the culture of our neo-Marxist post-Freudian world. I am good, and you are trying to prevent me from enjoying my goodness. Good is me. Bad is everything that opposes me. And into this context comes this question of the catechisms, which is challenging for us who live within this world. Why do good works? If you have imbibed, if you allow the spirit of the age to shape your thinking and affections, it's a very difficult question to answer. Because culturally and personally, so often, our motivation, based on what our culture teaches, is that we get what we want when we do what we want. Just think of capitalism and the way it's understood in the modern context. Not in the way that it was understood in its original context, but in the way that it is understood today. Greed is good. Because if you pursue your greed, if you pursue what makes you happy, then then your life will be blessed. Maybe we don't think quite that badly or that boldly, but we do say such things in our own context. We speak of doing good as its own reward. What are we saying there? We're saying I'm happy when I do good things. I make me happy. It is easy, you see, to adopt the worldly mentality and perspective and orientation that says that I am the arbiter of good and what is right and happy and blessed. And that to be honest, other people, parents, teachers, employers, neighbors, anyone, they're the ones who are really the people who prevent me from enjoying life. Even in the church, we can become angry and frustrated with those in our lives who are trying to teach us the way, who are trying to show us the more excellent way. We can become angry with parents We can say that they're brainwashing us, that they're oppressing us, that they're just trying to get us to be like them. That I don't want, I'm not like you. I want to be my own person. You hear that sometimes from your children. We can blame teachers. We can blame society. We can blame others. We can constantly point the finger at those around us saying, it's not my fault, it's their fault. That's the world in which we live. That's the spirit that invades the church. And that's what we must resist because the Christocentric response of the believer is radically different. The Christocentric response of the believer begins by acknowledging that we have been redeemed by His blood, 
Oh yes, the foundation of our response to God is His grace. The beginning of our answer is what Jesus has already done. Yes, Jesus has freed us. Jesus has broken the chains. Jesus has illuminated the dark mind. Jesus has made alive the dead spirit. He has given us a heart of flesh in place of a heart of stone. Jesus has done a glorious and great work in every believer. And by that great work, He is renewing us in His own image by His Spirit. For not only has Jesus by His grace defeated the guilt of sin so that we need never fear the judgment of God, but He has also defeated, or He has also defeated, its power. It no longer has a claim upon us. It no longer can force us to do what it wants. When Israel was in Egypt, they had no choice but to obey their cruel taskmasters. When they were in the desert... They no longer needed to obey their taskmasters. They chose to repeatedly. Let's go back to Egypt to where we had leaks and all of that. We want to be under that oppression. We can do the same thing when it comes to sin. We can choose to be under sin. We can choose to live the way of sin. But we don't have to. Not anymore. It was Augustine who taught that there are four states of man. That in the beginning before the fall into sin, he was able to sin. But following the fall into sin, he was unable to not sin. But now in Jesus Christ is able to not sin. And that will finally in eternity be unable to sin. We are able to not sin now. Because the Spirit of Christ has worked in us. Because Jesus Christ is transforming us. Because we are being made new. Who doesn't desire to be made new, having been delivered out of the darkness of death, out of the pain and misery of sin, out of the rebelliousness against God that sees us banging our heads against the great and glorious sovereign Lord, thinking we can defeat Him. You look at our world and you scratch your head, you wonder why they can be so foolish, how our co-workers and neighbors can make such bad choices time and time again. And the answer is that they believe that they can defy God, that they can live apart from His will and word, and that they can indeed escape His judgment. Thanks be to God that we have been delivered from that by His grace in Jesus Christ, so that no one, no more do we live in the foolishness of our sinful selves, but have been made alive in Jesus Christ. The answer to our question, why, concerns not only what Christ has done, but is doing in us and through us. Which is only to say that if you want to understand why the Christian does good works, you need to understand Jesus' great work. For we are not inherently good, and no one around us is either. But Christ is, and He's doing a wondrous work in us. This requires you understand already a radical shift in our thinking and approach to life. The consumerist and capitalist model that motivates by selfishness and by the exchange of goods, my good works for some defined benefit, no longer is acceptable for the believer. Selfishness may not be our motivation. I don't do good works because it benefits me. Now the Christocentric approach requires seeing that all of life is radically different and has a radically different focus and foundation. I mean, consider only the language of in His image as we find it in the Catechism. The Scripture teaches this very thing, Romans 8, verse 29, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49, as well as Colossians 3, verse 10. You remember that the original image bearers turned rebels are now being restored into the image of Christ. This means that the Lord is restoring and renewing us in the midst of this fallen world so that we become lights in the very darkness of this life. And Christ's work of reshaping not only us but indeed all of life so that one day He will come again and judge the living and the dead and will usher in the new heavens and the new earth. This earth that is currently under the groaning weight of the curse will be delivered from it so that it too will rejoice in the great King and Redeemer who came to deliver it. For God so loved the whole earth. He loved the cosmos. Therefore He gave His Son. 
Indeed, the God who sent Noah by the ark to be delivered from the flood and so deliver all of animals, so loves this world that he is renewing it by his power, is not using his power to renew this earth as though it were some minor element to his plan, but in fact has as its very central purpose the full and total renewal of life free from all of sin on this earth. Redemption isn't about escaping life. Redemption isn't about getting away from humanity, getting away from the trouble, getting away from the burden. Redemption is about transforming life. The renewing work of the Holy Spirit, you understand, doesn't get us out of this existence, but so frees this existence that ultimately He makes us more human, more free, more alive. I mean, consider, if the good life is defined in terms of personal happiness and personal success, defined by personal priorities, then Christianity is not at all helpful or good. I mean, to, to understand how this is, just consider the context of our world's modern art program. You may recall some years ago how someone stapled a banana to the wall and it was sold for millions of dollars. And we stand back and we say, that's, that's, that's insane. But our world says, well, well, where do you get off saying that that's insane? You don't get to, if, if it makes me ha- if I think that it's art, then who are you to say any different? But if the good life is defined as God's Word defines it, as the Westminster Shorter Catechism defines it, that we are to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, then living in fellowship with God and in praise of His name, being His image bearer, is what it means to be alive and to be human and to be free. Then think of, or think in terms of such great masterpieces as the threatened swan, by Jan Asselijn, hanging in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, a beautiful painting. A painting that has had at its time to be restored after suffering years of dust and dirt and decay. And now the restorer takes and very carefully makes the beauty of that piece of art shine. The painting is not less of a masterpiece because of the restoring work. It is more of a masterpiece as a result. So it is with God. Man, in his view of life, ends up in an empty, pointless, insane reality full of anxiety, pain, and grief. But God in His redeeming works makes what's beautiful even more beautiful. Praise the Lord that His plan of redemption does not leave us in our twisted, perverted, and broken reality, but restores, renews, and refines us so that we become more of who we are. Too quickly, our old nature chimes in when we talk about good works and turns the whole discussion into a burden. It says, oh no, here we go again. Here we're going to talk about the commandments and all these rules and how we have to obey these silly requirements and we're going to argue again about what's allowed to be done on Sunday and the rest. And we leave out a great sigh. The Catechism says there's none of that when it comes to the Christian's life. Oh no, says the Catechism, this is not a great burden. This is a great glorious element of God's redeeming work whereby we are richly blessed and our lives profoundly improved. It should be a joy to us to know that this too is part of the Lord's plan. That He's making us who we are to be as He sanctifies us by His Spirit and renews us in the image of His Son so that we are more fully human, more fully free, more fully alive because of His work. Do you not want to be more alive? Do you not want to be more human? Do you not want to be more blessed? To think that we should not do good works is to think that we should not be alive. That we should not be redeemed. It is to reject the very foundation upon which we stand. It is to be like Adam in the beginning. When he denied God, even though God was the one who had breathed life into him, even though God was his sustaining father, the one who held his life in the very palm of his hand, to then say to God, I reject you. 
is to not turn that hand into dust or mist or to make it disappear. It is to turn it into a fist. So it is for the Christian. Why should we live the Christian life? Because it's who we are. And if it's not who we are, then we are in grave danger. Not only is the grace of our good works such that God is redeeming us and so making us to be new, the goal of our good works is that we are thankful and assured in our walk with the Lord and our neighbors are one for Him. The Catechism offers three goals for our good works. In the answer of the Catechism, there are three so that statements so that our whole lives, we, so that with our whole lives, we may show that we are thankful to God for His benefits and that He may be praised through us. That's the number one goal of our good works and the, most, the one of the greatest priority. Then it says, so that we may be assured by our, uh, by our faith, by its fruit, of our faith rather, by its fruit. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more later. We want to avoid selfishness even in this encouraging goal for our good works that is, don't do just good works to prove to yourself that you're a Christian. That, that gets too selfish too quickly. But we'll see what that means in a moment. And then so that our members, our neighbors rather, may be won over to Christ by our godly living. We want to appreciate why this connection exists, not just how this works, but why this works. Well, let's consider the first goal, the glorifying of God. Here is the central purpose of our being created and redeemed. We exist for the purpose of glorifying God and of praising Him like all of creation. You remember Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. And indeed, the picture of eternity is that of a people praising their God. We saw this morning in our call to worship from Revelation 4, something like this. And one day, all men will bow and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, as Philippians 2 tells us. So the purpose of our existence is to glorify God, and one day we will all do it, willingly or unwillingly, to the praise of God or in anger for Him or against Him because of sin. But what the Catechism teaches here is that doing good pleases the Lord and that it praises the Lord. We need to think about that for a moment. That doing good, our doing good, pleases and praises our God. That means you understand that our doing good is no longer a simple ticking of boxes, a doing the right thing to stay out of trouble, an empty and lifeless spirituality that says, okay, I guess I have to do this and not that in order to stay out of trouble. Already, the catechism reminds us that when we do good, we do it with a face that's lifted heavenward, pleased with the God who has redeemed us, wanting to praise Him for what He's done to us, grateful for His having purchased our lives. Or to put it another way, there is no burden, there is no drudgery, there is no sorrow for the believer when they're called to do good works. The second goal, being assured of our faith, requires careful consideration. It is not do good until you are confident that you're saved. That's like test driving a car. You might want to buy a new car or buy a car on a used car lot and you go to take it for a test test drive. How long do you test drive? Well, you test drive it long enough that you can know that this vehicle is worthy of your purchase. The Christian life is not something that you do long enough to know that you're actually saved and no more. Instead, we should understand the Christian life the way that we're understanding the creation around us at this time of the year. You can see new buds on the trees. Some of us in school do that styrofoam cup experiment where you put a bean plant or a bean seed in it, and then you wait to see if that bean seed's growing. Some of us, in God's grace and goodness, are expecting children. And what do we do when we are Given the news that we're expecting, we can't wait to feel the basic fluttering, the beginning kicks of our child in our womb. Why is that? Why do we like to see the buds in the spring? Why do we like to see the, bud, the, the bean plant sprouting? Why do we like to feel the kick of our child within our womb? Well, because they all demonstrate externally what cannot be seen internally. They confirm our heart's desire. They say, yes, there is life here. Now, no one says, well, that's good enough. I'm good. I feel the kicking of the baby. 
I don't need anything more. Oh no, we want the full birth, the life to be held in our arms. We want the trees to blossom, the leaves to grow. We want the scent of the blossoms to fill the air. We want to see that bean plant not only begin to sprout, but to bear forth beans. So it is for the Christian. There is no levels of enough righteousness. There's no enough, I'm, I've proven I'm saved. What else do you want? There's no, I don't need to do more because I'm good enough. There is only a daily enjoying and experiencing of the Spirit's presence in our lives who progressively and persistently enables us so that more and more we become the people God wants us to be. The Christian is never satisfied with their piety, never satisfied with their spirituality, always wants to see more, always wants to experience more. Indeed, we can grieve over the slowness and the smallness of our piety and wonder, Lord, why haven't I developed more quickly? But we never say, enough's enough. I've proved I'm saved. Are you suggesting to me when the elder comes, when the minister comes and calls us to repentance and faith and calls us to a new life, are you saying I'm not saved? If you ask that question, you've misunderstood salvation. And there's a good chance the answer to that question is yes. If you don't understand what God has done, if you think that your piety is just enough to get over the line in order to earn salvation, you have not understood who Jesus Christ is. The final goal, winning the neighbor, reminds us that our lives are to be a light in this dark world. It's rumored that St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Now, there is no evidence that he said that. And it's not actually a great saying. But there is something about it that resonates with us, isn't it? That is, that our lives ought to line up with our actions. That is, if we're an employer and we treat our employees poorly and then invite them to church, we're not giving them a good reason to come. Or that if we're a friend and, and, and we don't treat our friends well, we, should be surpri- we shouldn't be surprised when they leave us alone. We can't say, well, wait a second, they're supposed to be Christians, they're supposed to be forgiving, why aren't they extra loving when we're the reason that they have despised us? The truth here is rather deep, you understand. The dead sinner cannot live as we do, but by demonstrating the power of the living God in our lives, we show all the world that there is genuine life and power in the cross of Calvary. We show the world that there is hope and that there is promise and there is grace. We are to do that at all times as Christians. All of our days are to be lived in a way that is distinctive, unique, and godly. But we are to especially live that way at hard times, standing out in this world as we shine the light of Christ so that others say of us there's something different about that person, that we may give them a reason for the hope that is in us, as the Scripture says. Now again, this teaching of the catechism presents a radically different approach to good works than we might naturally understand. The typical questions we hear when pressing the command of God's Word into the life of a friend or even of ourselves is, do I have to? If I don't, will I go to hell? This question expresses or exposes our natural approach to relationships. That in relationships and on all our relationships, we tend to do only what we must to get what we want, but precious little else. Now, we can be pretty good at that. You see a young man, all of a sudden come to church with his hair clean, and he's got cologne on, and he's dressed up. You know there's a girl involved. We can fake it really well. But once the girl gets hooked and the rings on the finger, we return to form. Because in the end, we weren't doing it for them. We were doing it for us. We were just trying to get what we wanted. And having got it, we give up. Consider how this mentality spills into our discussion of the Christian lifestyle. I can remember uh, when I was very young, my father waking me up at five in the morning so that I could shovel the neighbor's driveways of snow their sidewalks and their driveways so that they could get out before I went to school. You can imagine rolling out of bed at five in the morning as a young man. You might ask yourself, really, Dad, do I have to do this? Why do I have to do this? I don't, why can't they shovel their own snow? 
Truth be told, it was more about staying out of trouble that got me out of bed than anything else. I lived at a time when parents had a firm hand and you didn't have much of a choice. But dragging yourself to do the work and dragging myself to do the work, I can tell you that I didn't shovel that snow happily. I didn't shovel it eagerly or all that diligently. I did exactly what I was required to and not a stitch more. And isn't that how we approach the Ten Commandments? We approach the law of God and the will of God with no joy, no passion, no praise, just burdened obedience. But the Scriptures teach us to ask a very different question. It doesn't say, ask yourself, do you have to do it? It says, ask instead, how can you praise God by this moment? How can others see in you a wonder, a glory, the light of the gospel shining forth? How can others be moved by your witness? The answer to those questions will inevitably be found in God's Word and not in our hearts. And we will have to put to death that old nature. We'll have to put that selfishness aside. We'll have to put that pride and greed to death and take up the humility of Jesus Christ. We will have to ask, have I been freed from my self-interest to serve my neighbor? Or am I still stuck under the cruel oppression of sin's lonely selfishness? Oh yes, don't forget, sin is never good. Our spirits want us to live in sin because they tell us we'll be happy, except we never are. But when we surrender all to Jesus Christ, then we find ourselves encouraged, praising God and winning our neighbors. Therefore, we ought to ask ourselves, how can I show my unbelieving neighbor that my God is an awesome God? Sometimes it's as simple as shoveling their snow. The problem is we're too stingy as a people. We make careful calculations. If I do this, I will benefit and I will go to heaven. I will get better and get what I want. We treat God like Santa Claus. Someone we keep happy so that he'll give us good stuff. The gospel frees us from that selfishness and shows us a more excellent way, one that praises God, experiences grace, and invites others to join us. And we are challenged this afternoon to ask ourselves, even before we begin any kind of comment on the Ten Commandments, is this your attitude? Is this your motivation? Is this your approach to the Christian life? The question before we ask anything about what you do or how you do it is, is this why you do it? Do you desire to praise God with your life? Do you desire to be encouraged by His presence in your life? Do you desire to win others for the faith? Are you a Christian so that others may be blessed? Or are you just a Christian so that you may be blessed? And the final teaching of this Lord's Day, the Catechism reminds us that not only is the grace of our good works and the goal of our, teaching us not only about the grace of our good works and the goal of our good works, but also the God of our good works. The Catechism tells us in question and answer 87, those who will not inherit the kingdom of God, reminding us, That it's not enough to be able to write the name of Jesus, to be able to spell it or know it, not even to be able to quote Scripture. That it is not enough for us to be able to identify truths about God's Word and wax eloquent about deep theological principles. The truth is we must be changed. Like Nicodemus of old, we must be born again. The Scripture tells us that so many as are listed in this question and answer will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this list is a litany of our society's current cultural context. No unchaste person, sexually immoral, by the way, that's what that means. Well, that's our culture. No idolater, adulterer, thief, or covetous person. No drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like will inherit the kingdom of God. That is a difficult word, you understand, within the context of a hyper-tolerant culture. One which sees the impossibility of such people even existing. Who are you to say that they shouldn't be happy? Who are you to say that it's wrong? And indeed, we feel that force within the church as well. You can have people who are coming to church faithfully, who are identifying as Christians remarkably, and who in only one small aspect of their life, only one minor matter, oh, they had a relationship with someone, not their spouse. But who can blame them? That spouse, you understand, isn't particularly nice. And Well, we all want to be happy. We all should. Who are we to say that they're not Christians? And God says, no adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a faithful reflection of God's Word. 
God's Word repeatedly reminds us and warns us of these very things, things that we may be struggling with. We may, be need, we may need these words to shake us out of our doldrums and drive us back to the cross of Calvary. Maybe we are the drunkard. Maybe we are the adulterer or the thief. The Word of God says to you, as you sit in your sin right now, you are not saved. Indeed, that's why we read from 1 John 3, verse, or 1 John 3 the verses 1 through 10. A reminder that if sin is the characteristic of our lifestyle, we are not saved. That those who are redeemed are changed in a twinkling of an eye, are made new. And we are to hear these words because they are necessary words in light of who our God is. Our God is righteousness. Even as John says earlier in his letter, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And we could list passage after passage that teaches this very thing. For God has revealed Himself to us as He is. And you can try to change God so that He accepts your failings, but you will find yourself disappointed in the end. God imposes His righteousness that is the standard of who He is upon all men. It is not a capricious standard. It is not a foolish standard. God's not trying to get us to jump through hoops. It is a kind standard of what is good and right. When we live according to the Word of God, we discover that His will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Those who do not live according to His will and Word do so not because the Word and will is so wrong, but because they hate the one who gives it. In the end, you need to understand that these words of the catechism, these words of the Word of God are true and are terrifying. Now, to be sure, there are some distinctions that need to be made. We're not merely talking about people who have done these things. Paul, after all, was a murderer. But we're talking about people who are defined by these things. Unrepentant, you might say. Unwilling to acknowledge that they are wrong. And we also ought to acknowledge that this list in the Catechism, and indeed in so many of those passages of Scripture, should not be considered an exhaustive list. This isn't the list of the only sins that keep you out of heaven if they're unrepentant. Most of these tables deal only with the second part of the law. They don't always include the first. This list does in question answer 87. It includes idolatry. But it doesn't include taking the Lord's name in vain or breaking the Sabbath. Yet we would say of those things too, that those who rebel against these commands of God do not inherit the kingdom of God. What we do learn when we study these lists, not only this one in question and answer 87, but those that we find in the scriptures, is that these lists only make sense in relation to who God is. Each of these sins listed is a persistent and personal rejection of God of God's claim upon our lives on some aspect of our existence of His demand that we acknowledge Him as Lord. Thus, while some people will say, I live for the Lord, I believe in Jesus Christ, I want to walk in His way, their lifestyle runs contrary to that. And it calls into question the truth of their confession. It suggests that the Spirit of Christ would leave them in their sin, leave them in their rebellion of God, that, that, the, that the Lord Himself is okay with their rejection of Him. Oh, they don't reject Him in word, but they reject Him in deed. And indeed, if that is true, if they are left in such sin, and God is okay with that, then either they're right and the Spirit of Christ is a liar, or they're a liar and the Spirit of Christ is right. Now the purpose here is not to gleefully condemn people, but rather to recognize that living for the Lord is a serious business. That as Christians, we can't say about the things of God's grace that they are secondary, that we don't really matter, that the transformation of the Christian life, well, that doesn't really matter. As long as you can say the name Jesus, that's enough. Oh no, if you are truly alive in Jesus Christ, if you have been born again, then you will be changed. And if you are changed, then you may struggle with sin. You may falter in sin. You may fail in sin. You may find yourself committing old sins time and time again. And you'll find yourself having to grieve and to cry out with David, wretched man that I am who will rescue me from this body of death. But if you don't, if you say, what difference does it make? I'm going to heaven anyway. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. If you think that on a Saturday night you can get drunk or you can sleep with your girlfriend or you can do anything else like that, 
and that God doesn't care, then you haven't understood the gospel. Living for the Lord is a serious business, not because God is so cruel, but because He's so kind. None of this should take away the joy that we express as we daily live for the Lord. Indeed, it should place upon us a burden for those we know who are living in sin. Indeed, if we are such people today, if we are living in these kinds of sin, if this defines us, we ought to be terrified. We ought to cry out to God for mercy. We ought not wait till tomorrow, but today when you hear His voice, repent. Must we find ourselves before the face of God under judgment? But it's precisely for this reason that God has sent His Son, Jesus Christ. It's precisely so that we might be free. So that we might not be defined by these things, but we might be defined by grace and love and goodness and service and sacrifice and all of those things that define Jesus Christ. Everyone agrees, it seems to me, that Jesus Christ was a good man. Even our world says He was a good man. And why would we want to be anything less than who He is? Why would we want to live in sin? You see, the question why needs to factor significantly within our thoughts and our hearts as we consider the Christian life. As we now begin the study of the Ten Commandments, as we begin to study some important principles and practices, and as we say, well, this is not right, but that is, as we deal with these sorts of ethical questions, we might say to ourselves, oh, but see, isn't that what's wrong with Christianity? It's all about counting the number of angels that can dance on the head of a pin. But for the Lord, these things are really serious. The Lord who sent His Son to die that those who are enslaved to these things might be freed from them and might be able to live for Him. The Lord loves to see His children experience and enjoy His grace. He knows we're not perfect. He knows that we're going to stumble and fall. His grace is sufficient. But He does desire that each time we fall, we get up again looking to Him, repenting and believing, putting to death the old nature, bringing to life the new, and saying to our Lord, Lord, lead me in Your righteousness. Teach me Your way that I might walk in it. None of us will be perfect. None of us will even be close to good. When we get to the end of the Catechism's treatment of the Ten Commandments, we will be reminded that even the holiest among us as but a small beginning of the righteousness required of us. So let's start with this. None of us is good. But let's aspire to greatness. Let's strive to be better. Let tomorrow be better than today. And next week better than this. And next year greater than this one. Let us continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and celebrate His mercy, and rejoice to know in our lives that we have been freed. Let's thank Him for that in prayer. Merciful God and Father, we thank You for this word, and we thank You for its encouragement. May it equip us to go forth from this place, not discouraged, lest it is because of the discouragement of sin. Indeed, Lord, if the word of judgment has pricked our hearts, may we find ourselves falling to our knees and crying out for mercy. May we cling to the cross of Calvary and know his peace. But Lord, may we who are believers, who rest in your Son, Jesus Christ, who wish that more and more we could live for you and are only discouraged because our piety is insufficient, help us to trust and to look to you for help and strength and to each day awaken anew and upon the glorious day that you give us, upon the blank page that is each day, help us to write the praise of your name and declare your greatness to all who know us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of response is number 534. Fill thou my life, O Lord my God, in every part with praise, that my whole being may proclaim thy being and thy ways. We're going to sing the three stanzas to the glory of God. We'll stand to sing number 534.
We have opportunity given our gifts and offerings for the ministry of Teen Challenge, following which we'll stand to sing our doxology 226.
Receive then the Lord's parting blessing and go your way in peace. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.